Herzlich willkommen. Hello. Welcome here to this debate, 100 years of German-Baltic relations, young perspectives for a future-oriented Europe. I forgot to take off my mask. You can do it as well. <laughs> Ah, so you are here. Nice to see you. I'm very happy that we have the possibility to do this hybrid format here in Berlin um, on stage uh, with students from Berlin and then also with students from the Baltic states. I will first start to say who's with me on stage. Just next sitting to me is today the master of the house, I'd say, Michael Roth, Minister of State for Europe at the Federal Foreign Office of Germany. Then next to him, we have Matt Vollmer, Undersecretary for European Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Estonia. Nice to have you here. Then on my other hand is Arnoldas Pranskevicius, I hope, Deputy Foreign Minister for European Affairs at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Lithuania. And then I have Zanda Kanyinja Lukashevica, Parliamentary Secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Latvia. <laughs> Thank you so much that you took the time to talk to us. We have here on site students from the Schiller Gymnasium who will ask some questions and we are digitally connected to some students from Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. And then we even have some people who are just following the live stream. And I think you have the easiest position today because you can just lean back and enjoy the discussion while the panelists and the students have to work a little bit. Um, that's the idea of this youth dialogue, which is organized by the nonpartisan Europa Union Deutschland, which is the German section of the European Federalist. And they are organizing this panel with, uh, together with its youth organization, the JEF Deutschland, in cooperation with the German Federal Foreign Office. This dialogue is part of a citizen's dialogue series, which is called Europe We Need to Talk, and is funded also by the German Federal Foreign Office as cross-border project. Thank you very much for that. I just want to say why we are here, because we want to celebrate a little bit. We have 100 or 103 years of diplomatic relations between Germany and the three Baltic states. And we also have the 30th anniversary of the resumption of the diplomatic relation between uh, these countries. And we thought that this is a wonderful occasion to look to these countries and also to see what the young generation has to ask when it comes to the German-Baltic relations and to the future of Europe. And how will we organize this? You see that we are in Germany, that I will start with organizing things. Um, <laughs> part of the deal, um, we will have the discussion in three blocks. And in each block, we will hear two questions first. One question from a German student and one question from a Baltic student, which we will hear via the online connection. And at least I know that in Estonia, you have the most beautiful internet connections in whole Europe. That's what we hear here when we are lost in Brandenburg or somewhere. Um, so I hope that this works. After hearing the two questions, we will have the opportunity to hear all four answers and then we, we move on then to the next block. So in sum, we'll have six questions. If we have more time, I'm happy to uh, let you ask more questions, but it might be that we can just tackle these six questions. But um, I think this is already quite a deep discussion when I have a look at the questions who will follow. We are absolutely thrilled that we have a graphic recording during this discussion. Uh, Christina Eumann will uh, hear with a, with a huge ear what we are discussing here and then paint what she sees. I'm just uh, having a look whether we can see her as well. Um, if not now, then after the discussion, she will present her work and her painting. 
Um, so that you can also see what you said, which <laughs> is quite amazing. I think, ah, hi, Christine. <laughs> we are excited to see later on what you did. Um, after this discussion, you can also uh, read about it on the platform of the Conference on the Future of Europe, which is an online platform. We will hear about this uh, later. And this was the organizational part. And then I'd say let's dive into the, in the subject with Michael Roth, who will hold a first speech here at the speech counter. Good morning to everybody, dear Sanda, dear Arnoldas, dear Mert, uh, dear students. Our main goal uh, should be to bridge the gap between you and us. It looks a bit strange, but uh, it's because uh, of the strict rules we have to respect uh, here in, in my ministry. And I very much welcome all of you. And um, I very much appreciate that you accept that we don't speak in our mother tongues. We have to uh, speak in our lingua franca in English. And I know, uh, for me, it's always a challenge. Maybe it's not a challenge for you, but for me it's a challenge. And so thank you so much for accepting uh, to speak, not in German or in another language, but in English. I'm very pleased to welcome all of you in Berlin physically in this room and virtually on the screens. It's so nice to be able uh, to meet so many of you in person. We are meeting on the eve of a very special date. 30 years ago, on the 28th of August, Germany and Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia re-established diplomatic relations. 2021 also marks 100 years of diplomatic relations with Latvia and Estonia, and our relations with Lithuania go back an even longer 103 years. I'm particularly pleased that we have the opportunity to discuss on the future of Europe with interested youth from our four countries. After all, it's you, it's you, who will shape Europe's future in the time to come. The ongoing pandemic, dear friends, has shed light on some of the difficulties for a stronger Europe in the future. And we need to be honest. Yes, we were too slow in the beginning with a common European response. We reinstalled border controls and vaccine solidarity with countries outside Europe had a slow start as well. But the picture is not only dark, and we have learned from our mistakes. We managed the procurement of vaccines at the European level and made sure with the European COVID certificate that we could travel nearly as before the crisis. We shared vast amounts of vaccines in the spirit of international solidarity. And we have set up a huge EU budget, unprecedented in the EU's history, to deal with the consequences, the economic and the social consequences of this crisis. We have learned once again the very core European lesson. It's together that we are strong. And this is also the message we should remember when tackling the other big challenges of our time. For instance, climate change. Here, the European Union, so its member states, and the Union as a whole, has it decided the most ambitious climate target and emission cuts. We want to be climate neutral by 2050. And we together, with all of you as the next generation, should put all our efforts and creativity together to get there. Another challenge is particularly clear, dear to my heart, is the one of our democratic values and the rule of law. The European Union is first and foremost a union of values. We are not just a single market. 
They are the very foundation of our community and we should cherish these values because they are not self-evident. We can see that every day, even in Europe, so we should not take them for granted, but live and defend them wherever we can. Dear students, dear friends, allow me a very brief look back. So we commemorate German-Baltic diplomatic relations since 1919, 1921 and 1991. Our common history goes back even further. Historically, Germany shares an extensive history with the Baltics dating back to the beginnings of the Hanseatic League and the state of the Teutonic Order in the 12th and 13th century respectively. Germany was the first country to formally recognize Lithuania as an independent state in 1980, a first step toward a successful diplomatic partnership between the two countries. Throughout the time of the Weimar Republic, German-Baltic diplomatic relations grew and personal relations increased equally. But dark chapters were to follow. The annexation of the Memo region by Nazi Germany in 1939 and the signing of the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact between Germany and the Soviet Union in August 1939, which meant the Baltic countries faced Soviet invasion, occupation, and soon after, deportations. The subsequent occupation by German troops from 1941 to 1944 entailed the unimaginable persecution and extermination of Jewish life in the Baltics. Deportations of Estonian, Latvian, and Lithuanian citizens destroyed centuries of Jewish culture. From this darkest chapter, we derive our responsibility and indeed our duty of looking back before looking ahead, to speak up against nationalism, racism, populism every day and everywhere. It's also this memory of ideological hatred and terror that constitutes the foundation of our commitment to the European values of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law today. With the dissolution of the Soviet Union, the strive for freedom and self-determination ultimately succeeded and led to the re-establishment of diplomatic relations. A key event of that was the Baltic Way. On the 23rd of August 1989, 50 years after the signing of the Molotov-Rippentrop Pact, the people of the Baltics stood together, literally hand in hand, to form a human chain spanning from Vilnius via Riga to Tallinn, manifesting their longing for freedom and independence. 30 years later, all three countries are firmly integrated into the EU and NATO and have reclaimed their due place on the international scene. Building up on the strong political and economic ties between our countries, we came together today to look ahead and to shape our common European future. What are your ideas and visions? How should the European Union develop in the next 10 to 15 years? The Conference of the Future on Europe is the opportunity for all of us to participate in a Europe-wide dialogue on all topics that matter to you. The sky is the limit. All European citizens, regardless of age, gender, nationality, are invited to take part in the conference. Europe's challenges of today and tomorrow are numerous. What are the lessons that we can learn from the COVID-19 pandemic? How can we shape the green and digital transition? What role should the EU play on a global level? How can we strengthen the EU as a community of values? But maybe you have 
completely other questions in mind relate to, to the future of Europe. The conference is open to your ideas and I'm curious to listen to your input because your ideas matter most. 100 years ago, only the boldest of minds could have imagined the very fortunate situation Europe finds itself in today. That the European Union that guarantees peace, freedom, solidarity, and prosperity. Let's use today's event to develop bold ideas for Europe's futures in the years to come. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Michael Roth. Um, we now have the possibility to hear some short replies and I'm looking uh, towards Mert Vollmer. Do you want to answer? I heard that you were said that you have five minutes. If you can make it in three, um, you'd have all the love of the audience. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you. Five minutes or three minutes is easy for Estonians. We usually get it shorter, but... Um, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, but, but uh, thank you, Minister. Thank you, Michael, uh, for your kind words. It was very, very uh, sweet and good introduction uh, to our discussion today. And, and it's really remarkable how long way we have actually gone uh, since those uh, events 100 years ago and 30 years ago. Um, and then, you know, here, here we are all, all together and happy. Um, so uh, today, I mean, we, we are equal partners uh, in EU. We are good allies in NATO. Um, we are uh, also working very closely in, in the United Nations, um, uh, where we are now the, the member of Security Council. So it's, uh, 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 it's very dear to us, this commitment and, and cooperation between our countries and, of course, with our, our um, neighbors um, in the region. Uh, and, and, um, and that actually creates possibility for us really to create additional security benefits globally in the UN level uh, to do something that, uh, that sort of puts our cooperation in, in a bigger picture. Um, but, but also in, in many other fields, uh, I mean, there, there's long cooperation, as you said, it, it uh, dates back a really long time, but there is still a lot we can um, learn from each other and uh, what we can do together. Uh, for example, starting from digital aspects uh, and moving maybe to other important areas as uh, green agenda, climate change, I mean, those are the topics of the future where we, we need to cooperate. And, and we are building up those ties together, and especially in the, in the framework of European Union, where we, we can do things together in a more powerful way. So, uh, uh, strong EU means more success and more guarantees for us to what we are doing. Uh, so, our uh, discussions in the Council, hundreds of working groups, uh, where we are all working together in, in a sort of daily daily uh, work to, to find solutions uh, that can strengthen credibility of EU, make, makes us stronger uh, and, and uh, again, uh, uh, mutual cooperation is very important in this everyday life of, of hundreds of different levels. And of course, uh, last but not least, the citizens' engagement in what we are doing um, in, in our government level. Um, this is very, very important and, uh, and of course we hope that um, at the conference of the future of Europe will, will bring um, some, some uh, fruitful discussions. When what Estonia is looking for, especially, um, is uh, discussions and maybe uh, hopefully solutions uh, regarding uh, effective internal market. That's what keeps us uh, uh, prospering. Free movement of data. This is the future. It's not the oil, it's the data that, that, that needs to move. Digital solutions, green transition, uh, and of course, the global role of Europe. That, I mean, if we are stronger globally, it makes our, each our country stronger together. So this is uh, uh, one of the main goals and ideas in this uh, future discussions that we have. Uh, so glad to be here, looking forward to the discussions uh, and uh, very much to the conversation with our young future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Arnoldas Pranskevicius, would you like to, to have a short reply as well? 
Thank you so much, and uh, thank you to Mikhail for inviting us and for all of you to come to have come here uh, to this beautiful hall. And I hope that one day you'll also be able to travel uh, to Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania and visit our countries, and in this way also strengthen our relations, which are now you know going for 100 years, and I'm sure will be going for many more 100 years in successful way. A uh, few maybe remarks on how we have changed during this uh, difficult uh, year and a half of COVID-19 pandemic. At least four lessons come to my mind. First of all, of course, is climate change. This uh, problem did not disappear, even though we traveled less, we consumed less, we a bit, you know, maybe stopped the air uh, pollution uh, throughout this period. But we shouldn't be uh, fooled that the real crisis of this generation, in fact, of your generation, is the climate crisis. And therefore, I'm really happy as a European that European Union, for the first time, has a strategy called the European Green Deal and has this very strong ambition by 2050 to become the climate neutral continent and by this example also inspire the rest of the world to follow. Second lesson, of course, is digital transformation. More than ever, we have become uh, uh, daily, uh, in many ways, dependent on our digital communication tools. But paradoxically, even though we are more connected in the world history than ever before, we also face a phenomenon of living increasingly in digital tribes, in digital communities that increasingly do not communicate with each other, increasingly do not understand each other, increasingly feel animosity towards each other on different questions, you know, from vaccination to, to many other issues that divide our societies. And there, uh, we as uh, responsible citizens, I think, should think how to bridge that digital divide how to use the digital tools in a smart way in order to avoid the rise of so-called digital dictatorships that uh, futurologist uh, Harari is talking about, or to avoid increasing inequality uh, and uh, uh, in many ways uh, 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 segregation in our societies. This will be also a very big uh, uh, challenge for your generation, how to use the tools of artificial intelligence, of big data, uh, and new technologies in order to empower people rather than, uh, rather than uh, to, to exclude them. Third lesson is migration. Uh, we have just discussed that uh, uh, you know, a few, few minutes ago between, uh, between four of us. Uh, we shouldn't also forget that uh, this will be a major topic for years to come. It has always defined the world and Europe. Europe has always been a part of the story of migration. Even the word Europa comes from the Greek mythology, you know, uh, the name of, of the Greek uh, goddess uh, who was uh, kidnapped by Zeus, turned into the bull, from somewhere in northern Africa, perhaps Tunisia, to the island of Crete. So not only this was the first story of romantic love, but indeed Europa was the first refugee in Europe. We shouldn't forget that. And today, as we talk, talk about also the hybrid attack from Belarus, and we talk about migratory flows in the world, as we see the very dramatic events in Afghanistan, we should be aware that Europe will have to face the issue of uh, migration in a very serious way and finally come up, come up with, the, with the common uh, and united approach to the uh, uh, migration and asylum policy. And the fourth and the last lesson that I would like to draw and to leave with you is uh, democracy. Something that increasingly we should not take for granted, especially with the recent uh, retreat of, de of democracy in the world in the last decade, with more and more autocratic states rising their heads, with more and more uh, illiberal tendencies happening in the world and even in Europe. I'm coming from Vilnius, which only is 40 kilometers away from the border of Belarus, the country where today the people of your age do not have rights to free elections, do not have rights to freedom of press, to free consciousness, who are afraid of their future and, 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 and not to get into the prison, the country where today we have 650 political prisoners, including quite a few students, and this is happening in Europe. And this has to be a reminder for all of us that today we have to speak more, not less, about human rights, more, not less, about rule of law, more, not less, about importance of equality, non-discrimination, and other principles that define 
our, our European Union. So I'm looking forward for this discussion. I think that uh, the future, even though it's terribly unknown and very, very terrifying in, in, in what it will bring, but if we as a civilization approach it with responsibility and with the European heart, we'll, we will, we will uh, make it uh, a, a very wonderful place to live and to continue our civilization. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Zalna Kainina Lukashlevica, would you also like to have a reply? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, dear Michael, thank you very much for uh, inviting all of us here today to Berlin and organizing this uh, beautiful event. And uh, it's very important to have these kind of discussions with uh, young uh, people. And I'm really very pleased to see so many of you here and also knowing that so many of you are uh, at the other side of, of your screens. And uh, you're ready to share your thoughts and, and, and your ideas. Uh, how can we improve uh, our project of Europe? And actually, uh, it was also um, the choice of Latvia. When we started the process of the conference on, uh, on the future of Europe, we had a series of discussions with young people from many, many universities and higher education establishments in Latvia. So just to start the process with a views of views. And today, here I know that uh, there are participating uh, students from 11 different schools and gymnasiums and universities uh, from Latvia. And indeed, uh, the conference is your uh, opportunity to be architects uh, of the future of Europe. So, uh, we are celebrating a special occasion uh, today here, and indeed uh, this year, uh, Latvia and Germany celebrates a 100 year anniversary uh, of the establishment of diplomatic relations and the 30th anniversary of the reestablishment of our diplomatic relations. So Germany was one of the first countries to reestablish diplomatic relations with Latvia back in 1991. And Latvia highly values uh, Germany's consistent solidarity and support for strengthening security in the Baltic region. And uh, it also brings us closer to a common goal, peace and stability in Europe and around the world. So today, we work side by side in the European Union, NATO, and other regional and international forums. And we have a common understanding of the European Val uh, Union as a values-based union with high standards of democracy, rule of law, and human rights. The world is changing rapidly, and we are facing a number of challenges, regional conflicts, humanitarian crisis, hybrid threats, migration challenges, climate change, trade wars, the COVID-19 pandemic, and many more. And these challenges demand a unified response and a multilateral cooperation. So the Conference on the Future of Europe creates a momentum to discuss issues of our common interests and common concerns. And European citizens, indeed, shall be and are at the heart of the conference and at the heart of the discussions. And it is our responsibility to build a better, stronger, and more resilient Europe. So the outcome of the conference must reflect what the Europeans want and need, and what the young Europeans want and need and want to achieve. So uh, to conclude, I would like to quote what Chancellor Adenauer once remarked. And he said, when the world seems large and complex, we need to remember that great world ideals all begin in some home neighborhood, unquote. And on this note, I would like to encourage you all to be bold, think big, 
and most importantly, act. So you have the voice and the union is prepared to listen, to hear and to act. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your welcoming words. We wanted to ask you again also to make some speeches, but we don't have the time. So we use now uh, the opportunity to ask about your stance towards the European Union, towards the um, connections uh, between these four countries. I told you already that you have a red and a green card and you two have it as well here. Um, and also the ones on the screen, I hope that you have near you a green or a red item which you can use. I will ask you two questions and if you think that the answer is yes, um, please show your green card or your green item. If you think the answer is no, show the red card or the red item. And the question you, uh, isn't as complicated probably for you. We want to know whether you can imagine a living for a certain period of time in one of the three other countries. For example, when you do a school exchange, for you it would be more probably to work, <laughs> to do an internship. Could you please show with your card, would this, this be an option for you? Um, you can show your cards, um, the online participants can show a scarf, a plant, a red hat, whatever. And I see here some green, and most of them are green, but I also see some red cards here. Sorry, I didn't see yours. You were green, 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 and this must green. Okay, so I can see that most of them are happy, would be happy to go to one of these countries. Probably after this talk, we have more green, greenish here. Uh, let's see how you would answer this after this talk. And the second question is how you evaluate the impact of the European Union. Do you think that the European Union will make a difference to your future? This might be in terms of membership, in terms of political decisions. Uh, we have, I think now, much more green cards and green, green, green. Yeah, for you it would be strange if you say no. Um, Thank you so much. I hope I couldn't see the online participants, but I hope that you could um, to see what they say. And now, finally, let's move on to your questions. As I said, we will start with two questions. And I want to ask Arvid Zen from the Schiller School here to go through the microphone. And online can already Justinas Balbieres of Vilnius Jesuit High School be prepared to ask his questions in a second. But now, Arvid, what is your question to the panelists? How far is the EU willing to tolerate the violations of human rights in Belarus to avoid a conflict with Belarus's ally, Russia? Thank you so much. Uh, we had Belarus already in your talk, so I'm happy that we have this uh, subject here again. And Justina, are you online? And can you ask your question? I'm not sure if I just don't hear you or if you have to check your microphone again. Can you hear me? Yes, perfect. Hi. Yes. So I would like to ask you all uh, how Nord Stream 2 project will impact the safety of the Baltic nations because, well, Russia is our greatest threat and Berlin is our greatest ally. So this is my question. Thank you, Justina. So there we are talking about Belarus, about Nord Stream. Um, Michael Roth, would you like to start to answer to these two questions? Thank you so much for the two questions and thank you for this huge compliment that Germany is one of the biggest or closest allies of your country. That uh, is a big honor for all of us here in Germany and in my ministry. Um, let me be very clear. Uh, the European Union is not willing to and does not tolerate human rights violations uh, in Belarus. 
we already um, um, introduced um, sanctions, economic, political sanctions, in order to send a clear message. We don't accept such human rights violations in this country. And we already uh, presented clear expectations to the Belarusian dictator. But let me be very clear also, and it is sometimes a bit frustrating. Our instruments as democratic countries to influence a dictator in Minsk, our instruments are limited because a military option is not on the table for good reasons. That's why the strong support of the critical civil society in Belarus is key. All these people who stand up to fight against this dictator should know we are allies, we are friends, and this is not just a lip service. This is much more in every day's politics of our countries. And that brings me to another very controversial uh, uh, issue. This is the Nord Stream 2 uh, project. My impression is that um, in Germany we don't have such uh, um, intense uh, controversial discussion like in many other countries, but I have to take into account that we couldn't convince our friends and allies in the European Union that this is not just a German project, this is a European one. And it's my government's position that we have to complete Nord Stream 2, 98% uh, is, is, is completed and now we have just 2% and it's a project with a broad European participation but what we really need is to send a signal that energy is not just a national project, we need new supplies, we need a better infrastructure to, uh, uh, to, to safeguard other partners in the European Union and there is another problem I would like to raise with respect to Nord Stream uh, 2. This is the situation in the Ukraine. And I very much appreciate our, uh, our clear stance in, 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 in the Baltic countries and also in my government that we um, need a new gas transit agreement be between Russia and Ukraine. The Ukraine shouldn't pay a high price, an economic and a political price for this new energy infrastructure in the Baltic Sea. And this is a special commitment of my government. We have to do our utmost best. We need clear expectations, not just uh, to the European Union, but in particular to Russia and to Mr. Putin to fulfill the expectations. And um, I hope we can do that. Thank you very much. Um, Mrs. Kanyenia Lukashevica, what is Latvia's point of view when it comes to Nord Stream 2 and Belarus? Thank you for the both questions. And uh, indeed, we cannot tolerate the human rights uh, violations in Belarus at all. And uh, so the EU is using its instruments and will continue to use its instruments uh, to stop the violation of human rights uh, by the Lukashenko regime. Uh, and uh, it includes uh, individual and economic sanctions. But what is very important in parallel, we are uh, providing support to the civil society. And also on a bilateral basis and from Latvia, uh, we um, can will continue uh, to support the civil society and free and independent media uh, by that really helping to many, many people who can uh, get a very c concrete and practical he uh, help, uh, including also uh, sometimes very much needed uh, psychological help. Um, and uh, we wait for the day uh, when these breaches of human rights will stop and the Belarusians will have a free and democratic and real elections. Uh, what concerns uh, the question about the Nord Stream 2? Um, 
as all of uh, us, I think we know, th the three Baltic countries uh, uh, remain uh, very strongly uh, against the Nord Stream 2 uh, project. So um, it is a political project uh, that contradicts uh, the aims of the EU's uh, energy union. And uh, we also believe uh, it will increase the EU's dependency uh, from one supplier and uh, at the same time also will have negative uh, effect on the Ukraine's economy. So these are the reasons we cannot accept the project. Uh, the recent uh, joint declaration by the German and uh, uh, US, uh, by the Germany and US uh, on support uh, for Ukraine is um, an attempt uh, to limit the negative uh, economic consequences, but uh, still it does not cancel all our uh, concerns, and uh, so we stay uh, clearly against, uh, in our position, against uh, the Nord Stream 2 project. Thank you. I think today it is, it is already a pleasure when we can discuss concerns and different attitudes in such a nice manner <laughs> and in uh, such a normal way. And I think we will hear more concerns about the Nord Stream too. Am I right? Well, of, of course, but maybe I'll start with Belarus for just a few words. Both questions are very good ones, in fact. I'm so happy they are so sharp and to the point, uh, as they should be. Um, the conflict with Russia is in no one's interest. Uh, neither is the conflict with Belarus. And sanctions as the tool, as Mikhail very well said, you know, they have, it has a, a purpose first to deter, you know, from, from further action, further human rights violations. Secondly, to, to, to have a penalty for the human rights violations that have been done. But they are a deterrence tool in order you know, uh, uh, to, to, to avoid any type of military or other confrontation. I think both uh, Zanda and, uh, and Mert would agree with me that for the Baltic states that border Belarus and Russia, for us the perfect world would be wonderful relations with both countries, democratic, prosperous, predictable, uh, friendly relations. Uh, you know, with both Belarus and Russia. This, would, this is something we aim. This is our long-term strategy. Democratic Russia, democratic Belarus, peaceful coexistence with neighbors, and there are no more interested countries in European Union than the Baltic states for this to happen. But we also cannot stand still and silent in the face of such brutal human rights violations, and therefore the sanctions are so necessary. On the, on the Nord Stream 2, that Mikhail is back, <laughs> um, indeed, uh, uh, you know, uh, Baltic states are the, the, the member states that always are on the top of uh, most pro-EU member states. We, we, we often are there in the top five uh, in terms of uh, uh, trusting the EU as the project. And therefore, often we also prefer European solutions that uh, contribute to the unity and, 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 and that are, that are uh, bringing us together. Therefore, also, we are very much enthusiastic supporters of the energy union, uh, of the common strategy in terms of energy security. Uh, and, and therefore, we also uh, believe that uh, the, the, the specific project does not contribute to that. Uh, it's, it's more divisive than, 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 than uniting, and it also does not increase the diversity of supply, but in fact increases our dependence on one supplier. And maybe the last uh, uh, thing I will say about it is that probably in the future, it also will not be so relevant anymore, especially as we discuss about European Green Deal, about uh, phasing out of fossil fuels, both coal and oil and natural gas, which is a transitional energy source. So as we are building a new uh, economic model and we are moving to the renewable energy based uh, economy, uh, this project also perhaps doesn't have much meaning uh, in the future strategic outlook of Europe. I think a lot of young persons have this hope as well when it comes to energy supply. Matt Fulmer, what, what do you want to add about these two topics? Uh, well, what, um, uh, there has been very good answers on, on, on Belarus. So what I, uh, I can add is just to uh, stress once more that what is happening in, in, uh, in Belarusian border with EU is, is a hybrid attack against the European Union using the border uh, between Bel uh, Belarus and Lithuania, Latvia, Poland. 
So it, it's not uh, some kind of migration crisis, or I mean, it's this very well planned and targeted hybrid attack to um, uh, to damage Europe, uh, and and that's um, why it, it cannot be tolerated in any way. And and the many things Europe can do. I mean, uh, uh, there's not uh, unlimited um, uh, resources that we can use, but uh, but th there are today concrete people who are working every day to make this happen. Uh, to uh, to work with uh, criminal networks to get those people uh, from from different countries to Belarus and then the border, we have to make sure that those people never travel to Europe. We know who they are, so there are things we can do uh, to to stop this thing. I mean, it has to cost more um, uh, to continue than to stop that for for Belarus. So um, uh, and. Um, and the other question about Nord Stream 2, I, mean, I would bring it a little bit to the bigger, bigger picture. I mean, we are all working with, uh, with the Green Deal, uh, Fit for 55, uh, saving the, the, the environment. It's all very complicated, but sort of if, if you bring it back to a very simple thing, then actually what we are doing in the world is that we are trying to rehabilitate us from the carbon dependency. I mean, we are depending on carbon. It's killing the planet, so we have to go to do rehab to get rid of this uh, dependency. I mean, and, and that's painful, I mean, because we like this life that we have. Uh, um, so this, uh, this is sort of rehabilitation process that the world is going through. And when you are in rehab, um, then to open a new supply channels of carbon doesn't strike me as a particularly um, uh, uh, sort of consistent idea with all that, that we are doing. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's my answer to that question. Thank you. I mean, we could have on both questions a whole evening talking about this, but I think this time we just use the chance to have a small insight above the country's perspectives. And also, I think it is a chance for the panelists to hear what are your questions, what are your concerns. And that's why, even if we haven't talked at all into deep about this question, I want to move on now with the next two questions, with a both uh, from Anna, uh, on the ones we have Anna Sinovieva from Riga Secondary School number 13 online. And then here in Berlin we have Anna Nierhoff from the Schiller Gymnasium. First, I want to ask Anna Sinovieva from Riga. Are you online? And could you ask your question? Yes, hello. So um, my question is really important not only for me, but for pretty much every single European out there. So unemployment, again, among young people is a very typical problem and younger employees travel all around the world to try and find a place where their skills can be used. The situation escalated during the COVID pandemic. Employers prefer to hire um, experienced workers only. By this means, no opportunities for young academics are given to collect their professional experience. Unfortunately, nowadays you cannot get a job without work experience. So how is it possible to break this vicious circle and what advice could you give to the new generation? Thank you, Anna. We will discuss this in a second. First, I want to also hear uh, Anna Nierhoff's question. Okay, so we wanted to know whether it is possible to institute a measure um, through which um, Europeans uh, or member states of the EU that seem less invested in European values than the Baltics or Germany could be excluded from the EU to progress into a more diverse and united Europe? Thank you. So we have on the one hand what to do with young people who want to gain uh, experience in working and then on the other hand what to do with those who don't see the value as important as you did for example in your speeches. Matt Former, do you want to start? Uh, well, it, um, it has been an issue already before uh, the, the COVID pandemic, of course, hit us. And, um, and, and uh, what I can say, I, I've seen different countries in my, my long life, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, places where this issue is pretty well solved is in the Nordics, at least in Denmark and a few other countries. Uh, for example, the, the apprenticeship is a compulsory thing for a company. So you it's not a voluntary. I mean, you kind of, you have to take young people from universities or even in and, and um, give them some experience uh, and that they can already use then to, to get um, uh, 
uh, get uh, real work in the future. So maybe this kind of, of action, I mean, we, we want something to happen, then the government have different ways maybe to, to push or, or to, I don't want to say reinforce, but, but, um, but at least to, to, to move things on that direction. So that, um, that could be maybe one way to, uh, to solve it in, in, in the countries where that's a problem. Um, and of course, the, 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 the value question, uh, it, it, it is an issue. It's, it's, not, um, it's, uh, it's threatening us not only because we are sort of the, 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 the community of values, but, but it sort of uh, erodes our, our unit and our unit is our strength in Europe. I mean, if we are not united, if, if, if I mean, the people, and, and that, that if you can see from far, those um, cracks inside uh, our unit in Europe, and that is undermining our security. That's, that's a deeper issue. Uh, but the rule of law issue is already bad enough, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. Mr. Pranskevichus, do you want to answer? What can you do to let people work, young people work, and what do you do with states who don't act as they should when they're part of the European Union? I think the good news is that European Union already has a, a lot of very important instruments for the young people to get experience, to get cross-border exposure, to learn new languages, you know, to, to really uh, acquire new skills. And I'm not only talking about Erasmus Plus and European Solidarity Corps, but uh, many other programs. So, you know, first advice would be to, to, to use and abuse all that Europe has to offer. Uh, this is a very privileged continent uh, with extremely uh, uh, vast opportunities. And I think in the Baltic states we have seen how, how our generations, you know, throughout those 30 years of independence and 17 years of membership of the European Union have really uh, appreciated the benefits, uh, especially the young people, uh, of, of travel, of exchange, of study, of acquiring new skills. Um, and, and, and this brain circulation is very healthy and very important. Uh, in terms of uh, the value debate, I think it's very important to listen. It is difficult and uh, uh, it's not easy, but I think all sides need to, to also increase their ability to understand uh, 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 the arguments, uh, to have patience, um, uh, and, and not to overestimate yourself and not to underestimate the others. Uh, uh, often, uh, while I was still working at the European Parliament, my friends were telling me, how is it possible that in the European Parliament we have so many Eurosceptics and some of the m most famous Eurosceptics, right, sitting there. And I was telling them, you know, this is the reflection of, of European citizens. Uh, they are a minority, but they are there because there are people in our society that do not believe in the European Union, and you have to engage with them. And you have to engage with them with strong arguments, with strong positive examples, with a strong positive narrative of Europe. Mrs. Kanyinia Lukashevica, what do you say to young people and to those countries with uh, special attitudes towards European values? I would like to thank uh, Anna about the question uh, on, on uh, youth and employment. And uh, it's a problem all around the EU. And that's why we also had a special program dedicated to the youth uh, and employment. But um, I think, and uh, I also know that the formal uh, work experience is not the only aspect the uh, employer uh, is taking into a consideration when deciding whom to hire. And um, I think there are a few uh, other ways uh, uh, a young person can gain a valuable experience. Uh, for example, um, internship or uh, social activism or also taking part in uh, EU-level programs, for example, uh, the Erasmus Plus program. And I hope that many of you know that the Erasmus Plus program offers not only uh, opportunities for uh, studying, but also uh, offers an opportunity for uh, internship. An internship can, that, can be, uh, uh, that can help you to gain th uh, the experience uh, needed for uh, um, applying for, for different jobs. So, and I would like to encourage you to use all the opportunities also to provided by the EU programs, including the Erasmus Plus and uh, pl including uh, this opportunity to use uh, Erasmus Plus uh, finances for the uh, internships. And uh, on the uh, question about the, the European values, possible European values, and the possible shrinkage of the European Union. Um, the EU is a 
union of values. So, and it shall stay, and I believe it will stay as a union of values. So, um, actually, meaningful uh, steps already um, are being taken uh, at the EU level to to uphold uh, these principles. And uh, since the last uh, year, uh, we are having a new uh, process, uh, so-called uh, rule of law um, process, where all member states are invited uh, to give a report and to explain how they see uh, the future uh, of, of their act actions and also uh, the strengths of the rule of law in the respective country. And I think it's a very good process well, where we can openly discuss and that can help to strengthen the rule of all in each and every uh, member state. And therefore, I really hope that we will see a strengthening of the European Union and not a shrinkage of the European Union. Thank you. Michel Roth, how would you answer Anna's questions? First of all, I fully agree with my colleagues. Uh, second, um, the best tool in order to avoid uh, nationalism, racism, uh, cliches and stereotypes is the free movement. So, um, we have uh, many inspiring and fascinating instruments, but they are very much focused on um, young people with an academic background, and we have, have to open it more for people with a non-academic background. It should be normal for all young people to travel across Europe, to learn from each other, and to learn with others, to overcome stereotypes and cliches. Yeah, and um, uh, a couple of years ago, the European Union was too quiet, too quiet in order to defend our common values. Um, it's not a nice to have freedom or um, democracy, independence of judiciary, rule of law, the fight against corruption, freedom of media, media pluralism, this is not a nice to have. This is an obligation for all EU member states. And we have to fulfill all the expectations and we have to meet the guiding principles because uh, this is the basis for our membership in the European Union. But please make a distinction between governments and we have very, very critical discussions with them, for instance, with Poland or with Hungary, make a distinction between the governments and the societies. Because also in these countries, the civil society is fighting for our common European values. We are one family and we have to solve this, but we have to be more vocal and more visible in our fight for our common values. Thank you, and because uh, I really like the, the question of Anna, I want to force you to say a yes or no now and no. make a round. Should there be a mechanism to exclude members if they don't act as they should when it comes to European values? Should there, re there be a mechanism to exclude members? Mart Forma. Uh, Uh, I think we, we, we need this kind of mechanism. Okay, uh, yes. What would you say, Michael Roth? Yeah, I, I agree with my colleague, but it depends on the details of such a mechanism. Because at the end, we already um, different mechanisms already exist. For instance, the so-called Article 7 procedure. But the problem is anonymity in the Council and that makes it so difficult to work with such procedures. And we already, in, uh, uh, we already established two new instruments during the German Council Presidency. This is the rule of law dialogue, the rule of law check, and this is a special mechanism in, in order to protect the EU budget. That means if EU member states violate the principle of rule of law, um, we can cut um, EU money from Brussels, and this maybe is a very, very efficient tool. Okay, I failed already with the, <laughs> with the attempt to force you to a yes or no, but um, the question isn't so easy, I know. What would you say? Should there be a mechanism? 
Well, if, if there would be one, I think it would, should be for serious, extremely serious breach uh, of, of fundamental values of human rights, democracy, and rule of law of the Copenhagen criteria that uh, defines the membership of the European Union. And of course, it should be very much uh, conditioned. It should be very seriously discussed. Uh, uh, overall, we do have those instruments that colleagues have mentioned that help us and help member states that might be uh, having problems with the rule of law to correct the situation. Because the, the purpose both of, 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 of uh, colleague member states and of European Commission is not to punish but uh, but to encourage the change uh, in in legislation in behavior to correct uh, uh, the the situation uh, it's a it's a learning process uh, and and every system uh, none none of the systems are are perfect and in democracy you have to keep care of your system every single day uh, to make sure that your courts are independent that your media is independent that uh, that you have a strong civil society it needs it, it requires every day watchdogs, everyday work, and the EU should be a helper here. And the ultimate punishment, I, I would say, should be there as a nuclear weapon, but hopefully never used. Okay, what would you say? Should, should there be a nuclear weapon <laughs> mechanism? Um, I think there should be a mechanism that would be able to really encourage uh, the member states to observe the rule of law and to really remember that the union is a union of value. So we need to stay together, but we need to follow the principles and the values we have. Thank you very much. We have two more questions from Niamin Ben Tanfus from the Schiller Gymnasium and online from Elise Mirida, who is a student of international relations at the University of Tarfu. Niamin, you are already standing there. What is your question? Um, ich mache es jetzt auf Deutsch. Um, es wurde jetzt viel über die Klimakatastrophe gesprochen und um, auch über den Green Deal. Meine Frage lautet, warum hat die EU keine ambitionierteren Klimaziele? Danke. Thank you. So she said that there was, uh, they were talking so much about the European Green Deal, but she says the, um, the targets of the European Union, how to tackle climate change, are still not ambitious at all. Why is this the case? And then um, Elise Mirila, what is your question? Hi, yes, my question related to green energy as well. Um, when looking into the future of uh, green technologies, uh, do you perhaps see a chance of cooperation between uh, Germany and the Baltic uh, uh, states in promoting hydrogen uh, as a good uh, green energy source? And the, are there any possible projects to be undertaken together to improve the infrastructure to be suited for hydrogen usage or, and or supporting research uh, businesses and startups uh, in this field? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Elise. Uh, Mrs. Kalnina Lukashevica, would you like to start when it comes to targets of climate change and when it comes to the future of green technologies? What is your answer? Actually, the both questions are very much connected uh, as the answers are. And indeed, the uh, EU is serious about climate change issues and its climate policy, and the EU is a global leader uh, in the fight against the climate change. And we are uh, devoting um, a lot of uh, the EU budget to fight against climate change and uh, to implement uh, sustainable and responsible uh, policies. And that includes also uh, hydrogen as, as one of the source uh, that is uh, renewable, uh, that is green, and that could be used. And uh, uh, Actually, I'm really proud that since the beginning of uh, 2020, there is a hydrogen uh, station in Riga, and there are buses that are in Riga that are operating on the basis of the hydrogen. And actually, recently, when uh, the president of the European Commission uh, visited Riga, that was the one object she visited and also took a, a drive with a hydrogen-driven uh, uh, trolleybus. So, and uh, indeed, uh, I hope that we will be able to use this uh, green and renewable energy as, as one of the solutions uh, to fight against uh, climate changes. 
Mm -hmm. Thank you. Arnoldus Planskevicius, what would you say when it comes to the targets of the European Union? I fully understand the question because indeed there are a lot of young people who think uh, it's too late and, and too little. Um, and especially if, if you come up with a very strong political ambition like the Green Deal, there always be, will be people who will say it's too ambitious and others who will say it's too little ambitious. And, and uh, 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 if you ask uh, farmers out there, also in our countries, or at some of the industries, they would say EU is too much and too ambitious and it will be too costly and very painful, the transition. Of course, if you ask uh, a lot of environmentalists, they will say we are already late as the global community and, 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 and those measures uh, might be not enough. But in politics, you always need a consensus. You always need a, a political will that uh, is supported by the majority. And you need business to go along because they will have to transform themselves in a massive way. And in fact, I agree with Zander, the change is huge. I mean, it is big in European history. Uh, we will be transforming the whole economic model. Uh, in the field of energy, in the field of transport, in the field of agriculture, in the field of environment, which will require a lot of investments, a lot of transition, a lot of adjust adjustment in all uh, uh, parts of Europe. It will not be easy, but of course, probably most of us who care about this planet hope that we will do even more than, 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 than we have uh, committed. And that, as I said before, that other countries also follow us. And here, absolutely, the uh, cooperation between Germany and the Baltic states can be uh, uh, very interesting and, and uh, in, in the offshore wind the capacity, in the hydrogen strategy, uh, in many other areas where, where uh, I'm quite certain uh, that uh, we'll find uh, uh, a, a lot of great opportunities. Hmm. Michael Roth, do you also see opportunities in cooperation? Definitely, yes, uh, that's why we discussed it um, 30 minutes or one hour ago. Um, wind energy, for instance, n renewable energy in general, uh, green hydrogen, uh, these, uh, the, all these um, 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 energies have a huge potential uh, for all of us. And climate is not a national challenge, an obligation, it's a global uh, obligation. It's a commitment for all of us and that's why we have to strengthen uh, our cooperation with respect to innovation, research, renewable energy and um, that's why I'm looking forward to um, to strengthening our cooperation in this in this ex extremely important area and we shouldn't uh, underestimate Europe's role on the global stage. There is no country no international community outside Europe which introduced more ambitious climate goals than the European Union, including Germany. But now, and that is the biggest challenge we have to deliver, what does it mean? What does ecological, social and economic transformation really mean? For you, for the economy, for farmers, for our societies, for mobility, for our living conditions in cities like Berlin, but also in, my, in the villages in, at countryside where I live, four hours, away, four hours far away from here. So we have to encourage others. And that is, the, that is our job as Europeans, to encourage others on the global stage that ambitious climate goes goals go hand in hand with prosperity, social stability and sustainability. And I hope we have the chance to convince others like China, like Africa, like India to join us, to join us to protect our climate. Matt Farmer, I don't know if in Estonia the Fridays for Future are as big as in Germany, so probably you had already these concerns also in your talks in your home country. Uh, indeed, uh, we, we had, and it's a big, big concern, of course. Uh, and so much has been said by, by all the colleagues uh, already, which I all agree, that I will just reflect it back to the young generation. I mean, the, the, the goals that Europe has taken, I mean, climate neutrality to 2050, we don't know how to get there uh, yet. I mean, we can get to some 80, 90%, but the technology doesn't exist yet, how, how to do that, which means for you, guys, that, that you have to give up something, some of your living standards. Are you ready for that? To reach the present goals? We don't know how to get there yet. 
So I, I have the green and, and, and yellow question for you. Um, the, the, if you agree, the green one, that, that the, the scientist, innovation, technology, governments, union should work hard and make it happen, climate neutral 2050. Green, or, or the green one, that all that would happen, the, the scientist should have to work, but I'm also ready to give up some of my living standards to reach the, the goals of um, climate neutrality to 2050. So which one you say? <laughs> Okay, so here I see, is there anyone with a red card? Just, <laughs> no. <laughs> so that's so that's this is a quite green that's audience. A good, that's a good for our future. I mean, the <laughs> yes, great. I mean, because that, that might happen. I don't know if, if the scientists will be good enough, but it seems that we all have to adjust a bit of our, our lifestyle and, and that will be um, oh, even in the present frame of, of, the, of the goals. Um, so and, and so let's, let's think where we can cooperate together. Uh, uh, where the, where the renewable energy comes from. I know a few sources. I know the solar and I know the wind. Does anyone know other sources that are available and that we can use like in the next 10 years? The nuclear uh, is probably somewhere very far away and not here in Germany, many other places. Uh, waves, not probably. F uh, fusion, well, maybe, if, if, if the scientists will make it happen, but uh, um, but, and then we, if we have the solar and wind energy, and if there is a wind, there is electricity everywhere. So if there's wind in Baltic Sea, we all have huge amount of, of electricity. If there is day, there's a lot of sun. So what, we, what, what do we do with this energy? The only thing that we know now is we transfer it into hydrogen. And then we can use the hydrogen when there is no wind or sun. So that's, that's all we know. I don't know if there is other solutions that uh, and that's where we cooperate i mean we we do the the wind sparks we we, we can integrate our uh, grids uh, to make it smart so that electricity moves where we need it uh, and then of course the hydrogen technology that uh, i'm sure germany is, is uh, a leading country and then we all need that and then we we can add our bits and parts uh, uh, there and and that's that's how we hopefully get there Thank you. Nirmin, you asked me before whether it's possible to ask a second question after your first one, and I'm wondering whether you are happy with the answers or not, and if you have a second question. Um, also, ich muss sagen, das war einfach das Typische, was man immer hört. Ich glaube, also ich habe in viele schockierte Gesichter geschaut, weil die Klimaziele sind nicht ambitioniert genug. Ähm, das wird von Experten jedes Mal wieder bestätigt. Es reicht nicht, dass wir bis 2050 warten, bis dann die Emissionen auf Null sind und äh, bis 2030, dass wir dann 55 Prozent äh, reduzieren. Also meine Frage lautet immer noch, wie stellen Sie sich das vor? Es geht um unsere Zukunft. Okay, so Nirmin said that for her, this, the goals by the EU aren't ambitious at all. And she says that there are a lot of scientists who say that it's not enough to, to say that we are emission free until 2050. And so she, she asks you again, what is your, what is your idea? And now I forgot what you said directly. Uh, how do you want to tackle the climate crisis? I hope that I said it correctly around. Would you like to start when you when you have someone who says no, it's not ambitious? What's your answer? It's a great discussion because you know, we don't have to agree with each other. And, and, yeah. uh, and I think it's a very good answer, uh, a very good question, because, you know, we cannot stop where we are. Uh, uh, and uh, the Euro European Union is the most ambitious player in the, in the world. Uh, and Mikhail was very right to say nobody else has taken taken such a, a level of ambition. But it doesn't mean this is the end of our ambition. Uh, but uh, and, and Mert was very correct to say that even with this ambition, we still will have to climb a mountain uh, in every single sector uh, with with very very detailed uh, 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 targets in every single part of our economy. Therefore, we will be discussing in the fall this very ambitious and big Fit for 55 package, a legislative package. It's not just a declaration, but a legal obligation that the member states will be negotiating with the European Parliament that will commit us all as member states and, and, and governments uh, uh, to make very practical changes 
as I mentioned, in every single sector of economy in order to transform the economic model. But not only the transformation of economic model is important, it's also the transformation of our ways of life and our uh, individual habits, uh, our individual uh, 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 solidarity to contribute uh, to, to, to the change of culture of, 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 uh, uh, of, of consumption uh, and, 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 and whatnot. So this is a very global goal of all of us. Um, and we have to show that it is successful, that it is competitive, and that it is profitable, uh, especially for other countries to follow. Uh, that the, the new Green Deal is, is the new cool, and in fact that uh, it is uh, the, the ones that transform themselves, especially in terms of business, quicker, they will be the winners in the long term, not the losers, uh, if they innovate fast and in they invest in the new technologies that will bring us closer to the 2050 target. Mrs. Kalnina Lukashevica, what do you say when you hear Mianan's concerns? Mianin's, sorry. This is a question that uh, it's very often on the table, raised by young people or not so young people, and I really would like to have a silver bullet in my pocket to be able to stop uh, the, the climate change immediately or in the nearest future. And I hope that we will find even better solutions as we have right now on the table. But at the same time, uh, I'm remembering also the discussions with the young people of Latvia uh, on the future of Europe, including the climate change. And they demanded a quick action. And at the same time, they demanded that we should be aware who is paying for that and that we should be cautious not to bring this burden to the most vulnerable part of the society and to the poorest part of society. Uh, if it uh, comes to the public transport or if it comes to the housing, so how it will be uh, affecting the, the families and the costs uh, of, of living. And so it means that when talking about the climate change, we really do need to act quickly but at the same time, we need a consensus in our societies. Who is paying and who is taking uh, this cost of stopping the climate change? But it, because it is not without a cost. Unfortunately, it may be, would be 20 or 30 years ago, uh, ago, but right now it costs a lot. And we have to agree how we do it. And we cannot do it only politicians ourselves. So we need an agreement with you, with your parents, with your grandparents, how we are really doing it, to implement it quickly. Thank you. Uh, Matt Former, what would you answer me and him? Uh, well, uh, my, my kids at home ask the same question. That they are your age students, and, and they are not convinced that we are doing enough uh, to give them the world uh, that is, is livable and good. Um, and, and uh, I, mean, I pretty much agree what was, was said. I mean, it's um, m maybe we should do more if we know how to do it more. And, and I think your generation seem to be able to do more because you are ready to sacrifice uh, your, your habits uh, for that. Uh, I hope our generation will do the same. But, um, but yeah, I'm, I agree. I mean, we probably need to do more. Michael Roth, what would you say? Uh, I fully understand that uh, people in particular, young people are impatient and uh, that's uh, extremely important that they share their impatience with us. Um, but, and I know uh, in, nobody likes uh, a sentence which starts with but. Um, climate protection needs public and democratic acceptance. Without that, we will fail. And I'm very much impressed that all of you are ready to change their personal lives. In my, con in my constituency, I have many people with an inc uh, average income of 1,900 euros. And if I ask an average family, are you ready to change your life completely? No car, no holidays, nothing. Are you, are you willing to change your life? They ask me, can you safeguard my job. I don't want to lose my job. And so we need 
social just ways in order to meet these goals, to reach these goals. This is my first message. And that's why I talk to the, to the people in my constituency. And the other thing is, and that's why I'm very optimistic, that we will reach the goals much earlier. I believe in the strength of innovation, technology and research in Europe. And I'm sure maybe within the next 10 years, researchers, maybe you, will find new ways in order to speed up our ambitions to reach the goals earlier than 2050. But it's up to us. It's up to innovation, research in Europe and all over the world. And the last point I would like to share with you, this is a special obligation for Europe. We have to encourage others. We have to be the front runners for climate protections on the global stage. But we have to convince others. And if I go to Africa or to China or to India and say, please, you have to reduce or to minimize your living conditions, your living standards, no cars, no fridges, and so on. I'm not quite sure if they will accept it because they ask us, you are rich. You are prosper, and we would like to live with our families on a similar level of living conditions. And so we have to convince them that this is not just a discussion about reduction and um, making uh, personal lives a bit more complicated. It's a huge chance for us. It's all about quality, quality of life. And that's why international teamwork is so important, and we all of us, we bear a special responsibility for the functioning and for the success of our climate goals. Thank you. We will have uh, the opportunity to applaud in a few seconds again because uh, Christina Eumanns uh, was recording us uh, with her graphic recording. Christina, can you show us your work, what you did during the last minutes? Yeah. Hello, hello from Berlin, uh, remote. I'm happy to show the results. You can see me now here. Uh, I was busy drawing and capturing all the thoughts and ideas. I will turn over my camera and I hope you can see the picture now. Um, the big picture will show you all the um, insights of our last one and a half hours. And uh, this is the overview, but I think um, I start I start here with uh, with all the little icons uh, to see we are we are here together, and I'm really happy to listen um, to your to your words. That um, it feels like uh, yeah, we are in a dialogue uh, together. Um, I put a little cake here to celebrate our uh, relations. Um, Maybe it is like a funny point for you. Um, we started uh, with the welcome speech of Michael Roth, and uh, thanks for that and all the thoughts from the other um, other ones. Um, we are together. Uh, we together are strong. And um, you pointed out uh, a lot of uh, things where we have to be uh, strong and to share our common goals. Um, uh, for example, the climate targets, the values, the migration digital communication, democracy, human rights, and safety. And what I really liked is in all that, uh, we have to work together and we have to think big. And of course, as we just uh, finished our last uh, talk, uh, we have to act now. The, the second part uh, was the part with the cards, the green and red cards. I just uh, put it on the paper because I think it's nice uh, if we want to, um, to um, exchange um, between the countries and use that as opportunity. Or of the question, um, if uh, Europe makes us uh, uh, the difference uh, for our future, and of course it will, that's why I put it here. Um, we talked about different perspectives, uh, about the strong support for human rights. We talked about Belarus, uh, the North Stream uh, too, and I put it here um, also to mention up that we need to have uh, to be free and dem democratic, and we have to use our voice um, um, together 
for the EU dependency and, um, of course, uh, facing the European Green Deal. That was the first one. And what I really liked, uh, the questions about the uh, um, work experience and how we fight the uh, young employment. And um, you mentioned uh, that we can use uh, the Erasmus Plus um, to exchange, um, to go abroad and uh, to get more experience. And that's what I really, really like. And um, of course, for all, that's why I put the all here, uh, as you probably can see. Um, yeah, so of course, uh, we let's use the opportunity. And uh, the second part is, uh, as we talked about the European values, um, and also, um, yeah, we have to fight for that. So use it as a compass um, and yeah, to, 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 to make uh, stronger narratives for U Europe. Or also I put the upload as a, as a, as a, as a young um, um, speak, uh, I think it's to upload something is really cool. So let's upload the values always that it fits for everybody. And um, as we uh, talk about everybody, of course, we have to listen to everybody, to uh, to all sides and um, make our values more visible. And the last part, um, I put it here, uh, the really nice um, like button uh, for the climate targets and green technology. Um, and yeah, let's use the energy, um, uh, the, the, the nature, um, and make our world better. And uh, therefore, we have to, of course, fight the, to the big, big, huge um, change. Um, but as a global dealer, leader, as you said, it's, uh, we have to believe in the technology and innovation. We have to encourage to fight together um, and also see it as a chance uh, to make our living and our world um, even become better. And yeah, the last last point was, um, of course, uh, we have to see it as a big target now. So um, we have to be ambitious, um, all of us, we have to be front runners and um, as uh, some of you said, I really like Green Deal is the new cool. So um, keep it up um, with that. And this is uh, the graphic recording, recording and I hope uh, it kept, captured everything you were listening to the one and a half hours. Thank you so much, Christina. I'm sure you still have a lot of thoughts and we are happy to hear them at the conference on the future of Europe. Also, this event is connected to the conference platform. During the next days, you will have uh, some more information in your email inbox so that you know how to participate in further discussions. We hope that you do so. And then let me repeat my thanks to all of you who uh, contributed to this discussion to you students to your uh, questions here and online that is the end of our live stream but you can follow us on social media of course for further events thank you and see you soon <laughs>